talking about morning jewelry. So what is morning jewelry? Morning jewelry is basically jewelry that's been commissioned by a jeweler to create pieces that are like literally for morning. So a lot of the times you'll find them with um, elements such as like hair, sometimes even teeth and like more medieval periods and they're really um, in honor to commemorate a loved one that has passed. So it's something that we've seen basically almost forever and it's changed over the century so it's really interesting to follow kind of like where it came from so we're going to be covering pretty much from the 15th century all the way up to today all the innovations and trends that we've seen within morning jewelry so during the 16th and 17th century we're starting to see a bigger wave of um, memorial jewelry come up. It's actually confused with what we call me memento mori jewelry and that was a jewelry that was heavily influenced by um, the Catholic regime at the time because there was a strong belief that obviously when you die you are going to be going to heaven or versus in hell if you don't live a good life and so the the saying memento mori was actually to encourage people to live a decent life and it was also to remind people that death could happen at any point because of course back in the days you know they weren't living to the same ages that we were today they were living to the ages of like 45 and under and so this was kind of like a common reminder that people would actually wear as jewelry it would be seen in kind of like skeletons bats snakes and these were all symbols for the memento mori and they're kind of like often confused between that and morning jewelry so the symbols that we generally saw for morning jewelry they were a lot more kind of like dreary they generally tend to have like urns they had weeping willows they had pearls to signify teardrop so up until then it wasn't as like collectively worn In the 18th century, people didn't grieve the way that they grieved in the 19th century. There's even a small little article here of the ways that men were required to grieve. And I'll just read a few of them for you because it's kind of funny. So husbands mourning their wives. So this was an article that was written to help people um, on the proper etiquette of how to mourn their loved ones. Husbands were directed to weep or to seem to weep at a funeral. He could not be seen at a chocolate house for the first week and was supposed to provide a proper sigh whenever good wives or even matrimony was mentioned, which is a little humorous. The third week allowed for a mistress if he did not have one. The fourth week he could appear in public. The second month he could obtain more mistresses if he chose to marry as a mistresses supposedly provided solace for melancholy. Morning jewelry really took off in the 19th century and one of the big um, pillars of this movement was actually Queen Victoria when Prince Albert had died she started to wear morning jewelry and morning fashion as a whole. She actually wore it for four decades which was not the recommended time frame at the time. She was said to have worn a giant locket with his hair um, around her chest and then she even had lockets for every nine children around her wrist with hair in every single piece. So she was like really taken to the fad and in the 19th century it had become such a trend. England was actually importing up to 50 tons of hair annually to support this trend. Hair and jewelry today is a little bit off-putting and I feel like it's not something that we commonly see. However, back in the day there was actually professional hair weavers. like. Um, there was even magazines coming out and articles on how to weave hair. It became uh, an actual profession for women to do at home. People also really like morning jewelry because um, in incorporating somebody's hair, it was actually a material that didn't deteriorate over time. And so it was very easy to incorporate into lockets. Um, they even wove bracelets with it and it would withstand time. So not only was hair actually woven into these pieces, but they were also um, ground up and put into paint and so it was also very common for uh, jewelers to paint small um, paintings on ivory and in the paint was the powdered hair of your loved ones. Of course for memorial jewelry there isn't only hair. We also found tortoise shells, we, uh, there was a thing called jet. Jet is basically fossilized wood and fossilized wood was an expensive material at the time and it was hand carved and so 
it mainly came from Northern Europe and it was exclusively kind of for the wealthy because of these things. There's things called Guta Percha, which I'm going to butcher this name, however, is basically something that um, it was kind of almost like a resin that they would um, make a mold out of and so the same pieces could be reproduced then again and again and again. In terms of stones, there was onyx that was commonly used and um, black enamel. Of course, the Victorian era, like I mentioned earlier, is a lot more strict in terms of like uh, what people could wear and when. For example, you couldn't wear tortoise shell within the first year of mourning because it was considered improper. And so there was three stages of mourning. There was full, uh, deep mourning, full mourning, and half mourning, and every period had its own fashion um, statement. And after the full mourning had been completed, uh, you were actually not to keep your clothes and mourning clothes at home because it was considered bad luck at the time. So every single time somebody died, you basically had to rebuy all of your black attire and crepe and fringe every single time. So it was a little bit costly. It was actually um, within the wills when somebody had deceased, every single person was actually to get a small amount that was dedicated for these jewelry and for these fashion that they would have to wear once that person had died. So it's a little bit strange because if you think about it realistically, it's like as if today, if you were to pass, you actually had to then give money to somebody to be properly dressed at your funeral. So it's a little bit peculiar, but that's the standard at the time. In the 19th century is when photography started to come around and in 1840, they had developed something that was um, called a, I'm gonna butcher this, a daguerreotype. It was one of the first cameras and it was actually a camera that was um, basically imprinted on kind of like a metal sheet. It was extremely fragile, but it became um, just generally more acceptable as of the 1840s. And so because of this, it actually influenced um, memorial jewelry in the way that people started to not only um, paint, their loved ones and create little ornate scenes that was then placed in the jewelry to commemorate. They were actually now taking pictures of their loved ones and wearing them as jewelry. And this is really strange and I don't know why this came about, but it actually, they started photographing their dead. basically recreate these scenes where they would take their loved ones and they would actually kind of position them in the way they want, address them the way they want. Oftentimes they would ornate them with like trinkets that they loved or flowers and they would then go and they would take pictures of them and those pictures would then be put into lockets for example. That had just become um, kind of the norm. Today if we were to see that it would be very peculiar but at the time, um, that was a way that they remembered their loved ones. It was also common practice to do this at home because back in the day, um, it wasn't, they didn't have morticians like we have today. When somebody passes, they're brought to the morgue and the, the mortician is the one who, you know, prepares the body for the funeral. Back in the 19th century, these, and prior to that, they were still doing these at home. And so families would prepare the bodies themselves and, and that is why um, they would also have these portraits done with the whole family. So in the US, as of 1876, the first cre crematoriums were actually designed and built. As of, I think, um, the 1900s, they had up to like 20 in the US. And so cremation had become something that was growing. Now we're starting to see more and more ashes jewelry. And these ashes jewelry can be done in resin, you mix it into the solution. You can also create it within the actual gold itself. Today we actually have lab grown diamonds that have ashes incorporated into the diamonds themselves. It is a little bit more costly procedure, but it is something that can be done if you are curious about that. Anyways guys, I hope you liked this video. If you did, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and I will see you next time. Of course, if you wanna make any requests, let me know down below and I will be happy to do them. Bye.